and people go, well, my house, my rules. Uh, but the my house, my rules only works when you don't have to be in this place uh, to survive. Edward Snowden has said that he is very much a fan of Bitcoin, but he thinks its lack of privacy could mean it fails in the long term. He shares his thoughts on the promise of the emerging technology and issues a strong warning about the dangers of a world without financial privacy with respect to cryptocurrency. Snowden says it is failing as an electronic cash system because cash is largely intended to be anonymous. There are multiple crypto assets that can be thought of as money akin to gold rather than currencies. And Snowden thinks that competition between cryptocurrencies is a net positive for the world. He believes in the crypto movement, but he thinks there are some major hurdles to address over the coming years. Let's listen as Edward Snowden gives his thoughts on the current Bitcoin market. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. And when you think about uh, sort of Bitcoin having a public ledger, well, once a dollar enters the banking system, there is a private ledger uh, that is available to the people who are performing uh, financial surveillance. So it's really just private to the public, but it's public to the prominent, shall we say. And I, I think this is where a really uh, sort of interesting change is happening with cryptocurrencies that exist today and cryptocurrency with where it's headed. Um, as it is today, uh, these sort of serialized physical currencies are universally tracked and monitored, right? Uh, we don't know by who, we don't know by how, but we know the capability is cheap uh, and we know it's omnipresent. And if it is cheap and omnipresent, someone somewhere is making use of it. Uh, but we, the public, uh, cannot benefit from that broadly. We can't see this. We can't do anything like that. Whereas, um, when you look, for example, like on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, that public ledger is uh, an even playing field. Um, but you could be doing the same thing with it. Uh, we see people using it for, you know, uh, trying to get a financial edge out of uh, the on-chain analysis and things like that for, you know, are these old coins moving or have these been lost or, you know, to make some kind of inferences from that basis. As we improve on the, the pre-existing systems and as we move to, you know, these uh, sort of smart contracts and improvements on the Bitcoin thing, like we've got Zcash and whatnot, we've got Monero, um, there's Ethereum, which suffers from the same sort of privacy problems as Bitcoin, but then it's also got things like Tornado.cash, which would be wonderful if an Ethereum transaction didn't cost, you know, $2,000, you know, dollars every time uh, you want to mint an NFT or something like that. The, the risk is uh, very easy. To illustrate, you know, uh, if you remember cartoons, you know, like the DuckTales, Scrooge McDuck, there's one guy who's got a giant vault full of coins and dollar bills and things like that. Um, and if he needs money, like a giant magnet comes out of the top of it and it just pulls dollars out of everybody in the town's pockets. Uh, that is what a CBDC is, right? That, that, and that's really all it is. We don't realize uh, that we have immediately been subordinated and collectivized to the central actor in the economy. Uh, the dollar is that uh, today in its electronic form. Uh, but the cash uh, sort of physical uh, legacy form of it, while it does have all of these uh, sort of limitations that I mentioned as it enters um, sort of the complex financial system, uh, when you go down to McDonald's, right, uh, or who knows, actually, McDonald's is a little too uh, sophisticated these days. Maybe I shouldn't use that example. When you go down to the bodega, right, or the deli, uh, and you buy a ham and cheese, uh, the guy who presses the button on the register that's been there since 1975 and, you know, the till pops out and puts the dollar in and gives you the dollar back, uh, that still works regardless of what the government is interested in. As we move towards increasingly electronic versions of cash, and we are using electronics and electronic platforms and electronic accounts and centralized services, those permissioning gates uh, that I mentioned before are our freedom from permission. Uh, becomes ever more finite and ever more limited. Uh, and increasingly, we're being asked to step more through these gates. And that is a tremendous concern. Briefly, I, I think this is what we see the explosive interest uh, in decentralized finance is all about. Um, it is the fundamental recognition that the purposes that made 
banks attractive, you know, back in the frontier days, um, are really no longer necessary. And now banks are legacy institutions uh, that are deputized by governments and by central banks, right, to basically extract a piece of every dollar in exchange for furthering the interests of this uh, sort of financial political class, that interaction there. And that doesn't really do uh, the world or the public broadly any good. Um, there are, you know, sort of Keynesian types out there who would go, we want to adjust the currency for the, the, the business cycle. Uh, but when we look at the world today, um, in the absence of a, sort of a non-interventionist uh, financial policy, is it really clear that it's succeeding or has it actually made things worse? Has sort of the infinite credit um, problem, I would say, incentivized uh, consumerism and materialism to an extent that it has caused uh, rampant environmental harm um, and ultimately uh, really created the kind of world-shaking uh, military conflicts that have begun. Uh, e even when you look, you know, nation on nation, not in the current moment, at 20 years, uh, you look at very poor countries uh, that are very unstable countries, and they're beginning to have civilizational conflict uh, with very rich, very far away countries, uh, because of that kind of extractive relationship where, you know, the, the monetary policies of a country that's very far away don't just affect the people who live in that country, they affect the entire world, right? And what if uh, we had a more fair or level system uh, where we couldn't have quite the same levels of interference? except for those who opt into that, right, who say that I want to use a system that does that kind of thing. Uh, and they could, right? And now we see a free and fair competition, which will really call into question the economic uh, sort of <laughs> religious tenets uh, that we have inherited from uh, sort of this, this uh, legacy system. And I think in, in terms of getting it right, uh, there's basically only one thing that we need to do. Um, which is we need to nail uh, private trade, right? Uh, somebody should be able to send something to anyone for anything. Um, and that shouldn't be uh, something that we can interfere with. That shouldn't be something, you know, <laughs> the government of Canada or whatever can say, we're going to cut this off. Uh, because if we do that, everybody's going to start doing it. And we, you know, that's not supposition. We already see it happening. Uh, whether you're for or against this particular protest or this particular protest movement is really secondary to the problem that, you know, at the flip of a switch, uh, we are vulnerable to being unable to uh, sort of take anything out of our wallet. That giant magnet pops out of the top of the building, and now, you know, these people aren't wearing any clothes. Um, uh, but we have traditional means of law enforcement and investigating people. Uh, that have been effective and will be effective regardless of the technologies involved, right? Uh, because we have this digital layer on our lives, uh, but we also have the physical layer. That physically exists somewhere. People physically uh, exist somewhere. They put it together and then the yacht goes somewhere. And these are all things that can be gotten. These are all things that can be investigated, right? And that is the layer where um, a sort of regulation should be occurring. I, I think the idea here is uh, we don't have any guarantees of economic freedom in the system as it exists today. Uh, and that should really be chilling when we look now at the technological capabilities that are being developed uh, to intermediate our uh, sort of economic interactions uh, when we look at those permissioning gates that are being sort of built and, and stood up everywhere. Uh, because a gate of silicon is actually much, much stronger than a gate of stone. What we need to be prepared for is this idea that, you know, government is not going to reform itself. It's, it's not going to get better. Uh, no one ever gifts you a better world. It has to be fought for and won. Though he said he saw issues with Bitcoin's public ledger, Snowden clarified that he was very much a fan of the technology and made a comparison between gold and cryptocurrencies, noting that the borderless nature of Bitcoin and crypto more broadly is an astonishing thing. Snowden describes gold as Bitcoin that can't be sent over the internet. He believes that many crypto assets are closer to money than currencies, and that people don't understand the difference, 
but money is a thing that holds value, and a token can be exchanged but is not independently controlled by any central authority. What do you think about this interview with Edward Snowden? Comment down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Library of Wealth. We'll see you in the next video.